Thank you very much, uh, uh, the organizers, inviting me to this very stimulating meeting. And um, as the chairman pointed out, I have been directing the National Center for Macromolecular Imaging for 30 years. And so I'm going to show you what can be done with such a facilities. And so this is a NIH funded facility, which uh, we have been fortunate enough to have uh, these four high-end instruments. It's really inexpensive. It's about $12 million compared to all the speakers we heard last couple of days. And in addition to these instruments, we also have a gallery of uh, very modest clusters, which we can one all the images that we recorded from our electron microscopes. And currently we have about 2,000 cores and have a uh, storage space of 150 terabytes. And so today what I'm going to tell you is one set of story about seeing viruses which can be purified biochemically as well as the viruses which are assembled inside a cell. So the virus that I'm going to tell you is called bacteriophage. Bacteriophage is the virus that infects bacteria. It does not infect you and me, but it infects bacteria. Now, why we are interested in this? Because it has estimated that more than 10 to the 31 virus particles, which are called bacteriophage, find in the biosphere. So as a result of this number, it is the most abundant form of life that in our biospheres. It's just a lot of them. So in addition, uh, these bacteriophages also play a very important role in maintaining the population ecology of microorganisms, both in land as well as in water. So in other words, if all these bacteriophages disappear, we really don't know what happened to our ecosystems. So in addition, these bacteriophages also have served a paradigm system for molecular and cellular biology to study protein foldings, virus assemblies, and molecular machines for many, many decades. So it's a, it's a fantastic s system that the molecular biology can manipulate and understand the fundamental biology aspects. Now, in addition to all this uh, basic biology, recently this bacteriophage has been considered as a therapeutic agent for curing bacteria pathogens because the bacteria generally can uh, mutate in such a way to escape uh, from the antibiotics. So one way of uh, curing the bacteria actually is to uh, treat that with, with uh, bacteriophage. So with these introductions, uh, this is the slide so the life cycle uh, of a bacteriophage. Uh, it's, it starts with the, the gene product, namely the protein, to form a, a captured shell. It's a protein shell. In these particular types of bacteriophage, the protein shell is assembled through a set of scaffolding protein. And at one of the corner of this bacteriophage is a set of proteins which allow the DNA to come in. So in other words, the energy, a motor involved to thread the DNA into the, the chamber of the bacteriophage. At the same time, the scaffolding protein has to exit out. And when the DNA is encapsulated, and then it at the additional phage tail with which it can anchor to the host. So as a molecular structural biology, we are interested to uh, investigate what do these phages look like at different stages of this assembly. So fortunately, the molecular biologists have been studying these phages for many, many years. A lot of genetics has been done. Uh, biochemistry has been uh, pursued but we still don't know how it looks. So as a result, uh, in these studies, uh, we actually uh, have used a electron microscope to look at uh, these types of, uh, of bacteriophages. So in here, each of these is a bacteriophage particle, approximately around 700 enzymes in diameters. And it has these angular shapes. And if you look at very closely, you can actually look like a fingerprint features. That is basically the structural signature of the DNA inside the virus when it's in look in the projections. Because this is a electron microscope uh, images. So all the images are uh, two-dimensional projection images of the three-dimensional object of the phage. So our task uh, of 
uh, of getting the structures is from these two-dimensional images convert back to a three-dimensional object. The mathematics behind this reconstruction is similar exactly one of the speakers who talked about the inverse problem yesterday. In other words, from uh, a two-dimensional information and convert back to a three-dimensional structures. Now, in, in this particular case, each of the bacteriophages are oriented somewhat differently from one to another. So what the computer program does is to search what the orientation is to this particle and combine that in 3D space in order to uh, uh, reconstruct its three-dimensional uh, image. So here is a, a, uh, a movie of what we can get out by combining uh, 20,000 particles. So it turned out this bacterial phage is equivalent to a buckyball. A buckyball in the engineering and physics terms means they have 60 uh, repeat copies that has the five, three, and two-fold symmetries. And so I call this biological buckyball. So in order to understand the structure, what we really need to know is to understand the structure of one of the 60 repeat units we call asymmetric units. So what I'm now zooming in is one of the asymmetric unit in these structures. And in one asymmetric unit, we, asked, we determined they are made up of 14 protein molecules. It's made up of two types of protein molecule. One has seven copies, another has also seven copies. And six copies of one of the proteins actually form an hexon, and then another copy form as one of the uh, pentons. And so what you're looking at is this uh, kind of six-fold symmetry. Now, the map is really resolved enough, uh, which we have a resolution around uh, four and a half angstroms. At these resolutions, we were able to delineate the boundary of each of the protein molecules. So what I do here is to show each of the protein molecule in different color. So this is red and blue, and each represent one protein subunit. And then that make up six molecules in this hexon, and the gre green one is a subunit make up one subunit of the penton. The black ones are another protein subunit, which are different proteins from the red, blue, and the green one. So in here, the uh, density is good enough. I'm looking from outside as well now, looking at inside of the particle. Now, the density are good enough at four and a half angstrom that allow us to build the entire topology of each of these proteins. Now, the way we do it is to use a well-known algorithm uh, developed by uh, computational mathematicians, which is called traveling salesman algorithms, in such a way that allow us to trace the path uh, from one end of the protein to the other end. So after we trace the initial path, then we use other sets of software, which is based on the physics of a polypeptide, what we expect, the chemical bonds and the angles. So that allows us to build the entire polypeptide uh, backbone uh, of each of these subunits. So these, these color representations shows the topology of each of these proteins. Uh, so now I'm flipping back uh, to the outside look and then side look, and then I'm flipping it to the outside uh, view of this, this, this set of protein. Now what I want to stop right here is this red color protein is actually has a long loop that span across the blue color protein in its neighbors. So that shows us how each of these proteins are connected to each other. In other words, they don't just sit alone. They actually, just like a good friend, is wrapped around its neighbors. And so the blue uh, protein, the loop, wrap around uh, different domains of this blue protein of its neighbors. Now, if now I'm zooming in and other two proteins, which one is in black, another is in white. So this we call a stabbing protein. And these two proteins turn out, based on our structures, is the one that span across the blue proteins of the hexon and then the green protein of, of the penton. So, uh, so that means uh, this is, these two sets of proteins really link the two capsomere 
together uh, from the Penton and the hexons. Now, the structure is good enough when we build the model, we're able to see the amino acid residues in the backbone uh, trace of, of the polypeptide. From that, we discover that the interactions, molecular-molecular interactions between these two stable proteins are hydrophobic-like, similar to one of the talk yesterday, talk about this oily light of contacts. Whereas in the other part of the interactions between this protein and the green and the blue are more saw bridges. Uh, that means they are polar residues that with complementary charges that through the interaction. So at the end, this is this both hydrophobic and hydrophilic light uh, uh, interaction that make up the, uh, the, the interaction. So now this is the full atom model of one of the 60 asymmetric unit that build up this uh, bacterial phage. And so now I'm turning back from the model to the density which experimental derive, and then at the end, we can get the entire uh, uh, atom model uh, for this, this bacterial phage. So this is done uh, completely from imaging single virus particle which has been biochemically purified. So in summary, uh, we make a cartoon of these two protein I mentioned. One has this topological look, another have another topological look. Now, when we look at the sequence of this protein, we do not find any similarity of any protein we know of. That means, based on the sequence alone, we can't predict exactly how it would look. However, if we look at the protein data bank, we discover that the protein, we just saw the structures, actually have a high similarity with several other proteins which the structure is known, uh, including the herpes uh, uh, protein capsids. So, and all of them are done by cryo ear microscopy, except one of them done by X-ray crystallography. So, that, that types of comparison allows us to conclude that if we want to make a DNA-containing chamber like a bacterial phage, these types of protein fold is probably the most optimum one because, his, because the, uh, the nature already uh, appears such a protein topology in multiple times. And so now having done that, we also look at the other protein. Does it look like any other protein? Interesting enough, the other protein has we call a, a two sets of beta sheets, and one has set has an anti parallel and other set has also an anti parallel They kind of stack on top of each other. So in the protein data bank, we find out many other proteins uh, which are from uh, animal viruses, also from other uh, mammalian proteins. They also have this, the same topologies. So that means, again, uh, what we are able to solve in, in these structures have a topology similar from other protein also exist in nature. Now, from that analysis, what do we learn about the, uh, the, the, the evolution time of this bacterial phage? Now, it has been established bacterial phage evolved really three and a half billion years ago, so it's one of the very early primitive life. Now, but in this bacterial phage, it's not made up of only one capsid protein, but the two capsid protein. One of them, the top one, look like any other bacterial phage, but the other one look like a mammalian protein. So why is that? So we hypothesize that this bacterial phage probably evolved at a later time, because this phage its host is Salmonella. Salmonella is a bacteria, in fact, you and the, me and the animal. So what is being suggested here is this, virus, this bacterial phage probably evolved at a later time in such a way they will hijack the, the gene pool from the, uh, from the mammalian system in such a way to make another capsid protein which look like other protein that in cell in such a way that it can be uh, dis, dis, disguised as a, 
a, a friendly entity in, in the mammalian system in order to escape the immune uh, response uh, to the presence of such a bacteria. So what I'm telling you so far is based on this uh, single particle uh, reconstruction from electron micrograph that we can build an atomic model. From that, we learn about the protein topology that make up uh, such a capsule, and at the same time, we can uh, interpret this in terms of the evolution timescale of the emergency of uh, such a bacterial phage. Now, having learned that, when we look at the data more closely, as some of the speaker, Mirma speaker, point out, we really need to look at the data, not just doing the reconstruction, not just doing the computer analysis. Important to look at the data. Now, when you look at the data, in addition to being angular shaped, you actually see something sticking out at one corner, which is we consider to be one of the trial vertices in this bacterial phage. Then the question is, where is the structures of such an uh, protrusion. Now, in the map, in the structure I, 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 I showed you in the last few slides, we assume uh, this called icosahedral symmetry, and however, this particular protein that's sticking out does not follow this icosahedral symmetry. As a result, the density is completely wiped out in the reconstruction. So because of that, we actually develop another algorithms which we relax all the symmetry altogether. As a result of that, we were able to generate uh, a reconstruction not only with the capsid protein, but also with additional protein in, in, in yellow, in red, in pink, and in green, and also uh, the concentration of, of DNA. So what I'm showing you here, this imaging processing, image processing technology has advanced in such a state that we can do a reconstruction not only with high symmetry of the object, but also with zero symmetry uh, components of the, of, of the virus as well. So now, in, so far I discussed about the structures of only the mature phages. You may ask the question, what happened before the DNA is encapsulated? How would the phage look like? So here, uh, I'm showing a, uh, a picture of another bacterial phage, which we image it before the DNA is encapsulated on the left, and then we image of the phages after DNA is encapsulated. As you can see, that in the left is more circular shape, on the right is more angular shape. In the accompany uh, reconstructions on the, in the bottom, you also uh, see that the, the 3D map uh, is circular in shape for the pro-capsid and is angular shaped uh, in the mature phages. Now, when you measure the diameter of the particle, it's about 80 angstrom wider in the material phage after the DNA gets in. So the question is, this may have the same protein, how do the, the phage particle uh, transform its, its size and the shape? And so the next uh, one that I saw the structure, how this transformation of the structure can actually occur by looking at the 3D density map of the two maps. So here is the pro set, and I am Showing again, this has about four and a half angstrom resolution, so we can build the entire uh, 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 topology of these capsid proteins. And so I am showing you uh, a morphing between the pro capsid and the mature variant. Okay, so you see, this one actually become more angular when you mature with the DNA in there, and I'm morphing it back to the pro capsid. And then I'm now zooming in one of the asymmetric units. And so in this asymmetric of the pro-capsid, you may notice that this hexon uh, uh, density uh, 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 structure is not exactly six-fold symmetry. It looks like a skew. And in addition, there's also an, an opening in the middle uh, of, of these hexons. And now if I move it, to the mature variant, you see there's a lot of conformational change of the, uh, of the subunits in such a way that the, uh, the hole in the middle of the hexon get close up. This is not surprising because the DNA has come in. 
the protein has to protect the DNA, so the opening has to be closed up. In addition, there is also the uh, interaction between these neighbors seem to be more intimately connected in the, in the mature variant compared to the one uh, in the procapsid, which the interaction between the adjacent subunits seem to be less extensive. So as a result from these two structures, we do see this a large conformational variations of the same protein uh, after the DNA has been encapsulated uh, into the particles. Now in here, I also tilted these to the side view. Uh, this is the procapsid, which has certain uh, 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 thickness of, of, the, of the protein shell. But if I move it to the uh, mature variant, the structural conformation change, but at the same time, the thickness of this captured shell actually gets thinner. So through this conformational change, uh, it, it, it gets thinner in the shell uh, of the captured particle. So now I'm moving this to one subunit to show you the last conformational change, the loop is moving, uh, the tail end, the end termini of the, of the polypeptide also change. So what I'm showing in this movie is to show you when the, uh, the same protein, protein is very, very uh, dynamic in, in, in its conformation, uh, it's not st static. And so uh, through this we can actually learn about this conformational variation. Now, so far I talk about phages particle, which has been biochemically purified so we can study the structure. In the re remaining few minutes, I'd like to talk about what happened when the phages are assembled inside the cell. Now, in that scenario, uh, no two cell is structure identical. So we have to determine its three-dimensional structure one cell at a time. So we go use the using also the HR microscope, but we do the tomography. We tilt the specimen uh, back and forth inside the microscope. And as a result of that, we have these particular optics allow us to have a tremendous enhancement in the contrast. I am showing you uh, the, uh, uh, the thickness. Uh, there's the cell uh, now looking at different directs, different uh, Z height. So you can see a lot of features are zooming, showing up. Now I just want to point out this uh, the specimen preparation I use is completely frozen hydrated. There's so no negative stand, no fixative. You can, you are looking at the cell as native as it is. So now I do a bottom rendering so that now uh, I can show different aspects inside the cell. These are the, the phages that are infecting the cell. And I'm looking at the side view, looking to on the other side. And so, in here, one of the greatest time-consuming aspect is to annotate uh, uh, the feature in the cell. So this is the cell envelope in orange color, and then in green is, is uh, we call thylakoid because it's a photosynthetic uh, bacteria, and then there are carboxysome, and then there are lots of ribosomes, and there are vesicles out here, and then also there are infecting phage particle at the perimeters, and then there's some expanded phase particle inside, and there are many other particles in purple inside. So this, as a result of this, we are looking at a completely uh, annotated uh, tomogram. With, what I saw here is only partially annotated, not entirely. So this is a vesicle, this is a thylakoid. Now this is a very interesting view. We are seeing this phase particle is actually uh, are, uh, are inserting into the uh, periplasmic of the cell wall in such a way that to protect the DNA transfer from the virus into the cell. Uh, so in here, uh, we also see other leaking ribosomes getting out uh, to the cell as well. So based on this, we're looking at this uh, cell infected by phages, not only at one stage, but at multiple stages. So we can actually do, I call, structural physiology, because now we are looking at structure at different time costs of a biological process. And based on that, we were able, the contrast is so good that we are actually, inside the cell, we computationally extract some of these sub volume and then classify it and average it. So we find out there are five classes of particle we were able to discover inside the cell. 
Uh, some has both tail and a horn, and some is only tail, and some has no horn and no tail. One is they look like empty, another this without the DNA. So I think we were able to capture the molecular structure inside the cell without doing the biochemistry. And based on that, we were able to suggest a pathway uh, how these particles are assembled. First, is empty, and then subsequently DNA come in, finally with the tail, and the tail with a horn, because this particular phage is a very special feature with the horn. So finally, I can't like to mention that in this particular technology, what I give you an example about looking at viruses and virus infecting uh, its host, but it can be used for a variety of biological uh, specimens like chaperone, ion channel, mitochondria, neuron, rod cell. So I think this particular technology can actually solve all kinds of biological problems. And finally, I kind of like to thank all the uh, colleagues in my center that uh, uh, contribute their hard work in, in the result that I show you. And this project, biological project, is in a long-term collaboration with Professor Jonathan King at MIT and Professor Wing Jing at uh, Purdue. And we also have a lot of help from Paul Adam, who was crystallographer, David Baker, uh, who are computation biology in the modern aspects. And some of the special optics we have is developed by Professor Nakayama in Japan. And so all this work is supported by NIH and Wells Foundation and the Keck Center in Houston. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Wow, phew. That was beautiful. Um, tell you. me what is your uh, molecular mass limit on these kinds of studies when oh. your time? Okay, sky is the limit in Texas. Uh, so we can look at very, very big things like virus. Uh, the whole virus as, uh, uh, as big as uh, uh, we are working on the herpes, for example, it has about 2,000 angstrom in diameter and 65 uh, 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 kilodalton. So now you're asking probably how small can we see. So in fact, we have been start looking at a, a small as a strand of DNA. We have actually a lot of exciting results looking at a mini circle of the DNA. And also we have a project with uh, a number of HIV uh, biology. We can look at the RNA from the AIDS virus, which we can look at small as 50 kilodaltons. Because some of the technology I did not mention is the the uh, Sonicky face conscious optics. Also, there's a new generation of Yechon detector developed by the physicists that actually turned out to be sensational. We can look at very, very small things. So I think the limitations right now is the data processing, which I haven't spent much time on. I think uh, I think you know we're able to get the data, but how can you reconstruct the the map? rely be uh, is still a challenge. I really like the, these techniques. The only question is, are these virus all the same? There's heterogeneity between different viruses. You're getting uh -huh. many of them in order to do this through 3D? Okay, so it turned out in this particular virus particle, we can get it quite homogeneous in structures. I guess your question is other biological machines, they may have different conformation. Can it's, we sort that out? Uh, yes, uh, yes, we then, could. And since we're average over many of them. That's right. So right now I show you a simple case to uh, which the, uh, the, the virus can be purified with homogeneous uh, conformation. But as in your lectures point out, molecular machines are very dynamic. So I think, and I think this is a fantastic technique to tackle heterogeneous uh, molecular machines with different conformation. I think the, the need is actually a very large computer and a, a good algorithm. And in one of the talk yesterday, talk about uh, principle of uncertainty. I think we need to estimate uh, what are the uncertainty in the map and so we can build a probabilistic model. So I think these are all computational uh, challenges at the moment. 